Hi guys, today we'll uh, do the first of the last two lectures, which is on databases. So uh, part of the, this course is introducing you guys to databases, and so this is what we will finish with. Um, Normally, this will take a little bit longer to teach you guys about databases. This is basically the topic of CSCI 440. So this is kind of two of the lectures that are still relatively compressed. Um, but it will give you, hopefully, a good idea of what databases are and how they're used. Um, and um, teach you on Friday about how to use some basic SQL commands. And I think that will set you up pretty nicely for a database course uh, if you do want to take one later on. So just as a little bit of history so you know why we have databases. Um, basically from 60s to 80s uh, people were using network file systems. So you had these big computers called mainframes. A lot of data was residing um, somewhere in the building that contained the computer linked through a network. Maybe you would have data stored on, um, where's my pointer? Stored on, I don't know, like disks or tapes or, or other types of kind of permanent storage. Um, and so uh, this was slow because of hardware, but also there was not really a good way of accessing data. So data was in files and they were pretty inefficient. Uh, data structures, you had these inefficient queries that kind of had to deal with data being on tapes where it was on tape, so you had to rewind stuff. It was, it was very, very inefficient. Um, also, accessing data, to access data, you basically had to write your own program that accessed some files. Um, it was difficult to add queries. It was very difficult to change the structure of the data, um, but at least you had access to a lot of data. So people then wanted to make this a little bit easier on people. Uh, a little bit easier to use. So in 1970s, people started working on a uh, relational database management system, or RDBMS. Um, and the big, the big idea there was to separate data storage from the conceptual representation of data. So while data was still in files, and today still is in files, there was a high level of structure imposed on the data, and then your high level query language or people developed query languages could work on that high level representation of data which then found the necessary pieces of data from the different files um, and basically this is what we still use today to a large extent there are kind of NoSQL databases and document store and other types of things um, but in 440 we basically cover relational database systems in more detail and in 540 we talk about uh, NoSQL databases and all the other cool ways of storing data that are not uh, relational. Okay. Um, there are other extensions to databases, for example, object-oriented databases where your data were objects uh, corresponding to um, object-oriented languages. Um, the problem was that this really wasn't interoperable between different languages, and so people have kind of moved away from, from that. Um, and of course, there are other ways of representing data. Um, you can think of the web as being a database of sorts with crosslinks. Um, there's different um, data formats like XML and JSON. And um, it makes it a bit difficult to organize this information and it makes information retrieval somewhat more difficult, but they do scale much wider to, to, to contain much more data than relational database systems. And so that's why uh, people kind of moved away from relational databases when it comes to very, very large data. Um, so database is still a very active area of research. This problem is by no means solved. Databases find applications in lots of different applications from scientific computing, data mining to economic data, spatial data. We've built systems based on spatial data analysis in my lab. Um, lots of cool applications. Databases make a lot of things a lot easier than if we had to do them on files. And there's always a need to develop new data structures, uh, query interfaces, storage indexing approaches, all that stuff are still very active research problems. Um, how to achieve the scale and speed necessary for things like online reservation systems, um, 
very, very interesting data problems in, in very large distributed systems. Um, the reason that 440 is a really interesting course is that it teaches you not just how to use databases with data in them, but how to design structures of your data uh, so that databases can serve that uh, queries to that data efficiently in your programs. Um, that's what really makes the course very valuable and I highly encourage all of you guys to, to take it. All right, so what is actually a database? Well, you're probably thinking of a database as a collection of data. Um, hopefully you're thinking of the data as being related somehow, right? There's some uh, relationship between the different elements in it. It's not just all the data or it's not just some pieces of data that are not related to each other. Um, from data being related comes out some implicit meaning of the data, right? Um, the data that's stored means something in some context that we're trying to capture. So you can think of a database as describing a mini world or um, what's also called a universe of discourse, right? And so you can think of this kind of diorama as being a mini world and you can describe many things about it using data. For example, the position of different trucks could be captured by data. The amount of fluid contained in these different storage tanks or whatever they are could be represented by data, right? And so this data or some value, right, such as X and Y has meaning in the context of this world, which is not all of the world out there, it's just some small domain, right? And so ideally there is this correspondence between changes in the mini world and the changes in the database representing that mini world. The two kind of go in tandem together. Right? And so the database is really just a reflection of some state of the real world. Um, and by real, you know, you can put quotes around it. It could be a game world as well, or a diorama. All right, so how is this built? Um, what we basically have is a database management system um, which you can think of as containing these elements. Let's see what else on the slide. Okay, so what we have is a database system which contains some application programs or sorts of queries that allow users or programs um, to access the underlying data structure and learn something about the state of the mini world. Okay, those queries then go to the database management software, which uh, is able to process these queries in a way that accesses the stored data underneath it. Okay, so the data is actually stored um, on disk in some files. Uh, maybe there's some metadata describing what this data looks like, and this information passes up to uh, through some connectors. Okay to software that is able to process queries and maybe fetch relevant data uh, and then based on the results from one query or from a part of a query, fetch some more data to satisfy the full query and then return the results in a to the user. Okay. So a database or a relational database will contain a number of relations and those relations are basically tables of data and okay, that's why it's called relational. Um, so in a relation or in a table, we would have some metadata. This would describe kind of what's in that table. And then we would have data stored in columns, or you can think of it as stored in rows uh, with the different um, elements being represented in each row. And so those rows are also called data records. And the different elements of rows are called data elements. And then each of those data elements might be stored with some type, um, just like in a C++ program, it might be an integer or it might be a string, also called a variable character with some maximum length. All right, so you can think of it as like a, uh, like a character buffer or something like that, All right? Um, yep, okay. So why would we want to use databases and not files? Well, consider the situation based on this previous uh, database where we have students courses 
sections of courses taught by particular instructors in a particular semester, and then grade reports um, for the students. Now, I should point out here that the student number, the students are identified by number, which then ha has a relationship with the student number in the student table. Okay, so there are these relationships between the different tables, um, just like there are between sections uh, in the sections table. Okay, so why do we want to do that and not store data in files? Well, consider two different offices at the university, the registrar, which deals with courses, and bursar, which deals with uh, financial information of students. So both of these offices would need access to student name, ID, the courses they took, but then the registrar would be more interested in grades to ascertain whether a student has, for example, passed all the courses to graduate, and the bursar would be maybe more interested in financial information to see um, what they should charge the students for the courses that they have taken or that they signed up for. Okay? So if we had this information in file storage, we could have two different sets of files, one at the registrar's office and one at the bursar office. Right? The problem is that um, we're wasting space this way, right? Student name, ID, courses would be stored in both locations, and so now the university has to store twice as much data, pay twice as much for storage, right? The other problem is that now you have data stored redundantly, meaning that we have the same student name in the registrar and in the bursar's office, and let's say we remove one student from the university because they graduated, now we need to remove that name in both of the sets of files, which creates uh, kind of challenges for keeping that data consistent. Okay. So databases solve this, these two, and many other problems. Uh, they provide you with self-describing data structure, so you can kind of look at the data and figure out what it means. Um, you don't need to worry about how data is stored. Um, you can just worry about the structure of the data as represented by the relations and not the actual files that the data is in. Um, you can view this data in different ways. So for example, the registrar can just see tables containing grades and this other information, whereas the registrar doesn't need to necessarily see the grades. Right? And then you can also share data between multiple users using transaction processing. I cover all that stuff in distributed system CSCI 520, if you're interested. Um, all right, so let's delve a little deeper into um, self-describing data. Um, so we have the different relations, student, course, section, grade, report, pre prerequisite. Those are the different tables, and each of them will have some number of columns, okay? And then for the columns, you can also define them and say that each column, for example, name contains up to 30 characters and belongs to some relation student. Okay, so the first four columns or the four columns of student will be represented here. And then you can say, you can see what this data looks like as far as um, how much data it stores, right? Um, so all this information about the structure of the data is captured uh, when you define a database. The other nice thing about it is that databases can automatically be set up to keep your data consistent. Okay? So for example, you can enforce referential integrity where every course number must, must exist in the course table. So a student cannot take a course um, if that course is not in the courses table. Right? You're not going to get inconsistent data there where students uh, seemingly take courses that don't exist. If someone signs up a student for a course, well, that course has to be in the course table for the student to be signed up for it. Um, you can have uniqueness constraints, forcing that e the different records have unique identifiers. So for example, you cannot have two students with the same student number. Um, and then also you can define all types of other rules on top of that. Um, these are usually called business rules, which have to do with the meaning of the data. So, for example, you can enforce that students have prerequisite courses before they're allowed to sign up for some course. All right, having these um, constraints defined in a system makes it easy to make changes to the database in a way that the state of the real world or the mini world is reflected in the database and 
um, these constraints prevent you from making mistakes by putting by creating data that's um, inconsistent with the real world. Okay. Another nice thing about databases is the insulation between programs and data. Um, call that program data independence. And the idea there is that we can define a program to run on a particular structure of the data and then if that structure of the data changes to some degree, we don't need to redefine those programs. Okay, so for example, we can add birth date to the student um, table and all the other code that was not using birthday is still going to run correctly. Now, there are some changes where you know, maybe you're removing some field that has been used uh, from a database and then you need to do the database migra migration, but even that can be managed a bit more easily where you have a set of programs that runs on a data structure before migration and then you have a set of programs that runs on the data after the migration. All right, so uh, just changing some data structure isn't going to kind of throw off um, your code in unpredictable ways. Um, okay, and then nice thing is you can insulate programs from data operations, meaning that programs work on the high level structure of data, but don't actually directly access the files that store the data that is separated. Okay, and then you can have kind of higher level um, access APIs where, for example, you can have a function to find route from A to B, which really is a set of underneath a set of queries to some database structure, which then is a series of queries to files that actually store the geographical data to do the routing. Okay. Um, so we have conceptual representation of data, which is what we talked about um, here before. And then you also have representation of data, how it's stored, right? And so a row in the table containing name, student number, class, and major could be represented in a file by some length of bytes, okay? So maybe the first 30 bytes are the name, then bytes uh, starting at 31, the next four bytes would be the student number, and then starting at 35, you would have the class of the student and so on and so forth, right? So by defining this data structure, you can store data efficiently in the least number of bits but the nice thing is that the program never has to worry about that. They can just access the name of the student saying, hey, I want the name of the student, and they'll get back a string, and they don't really need to worry that that string is up to 30 characters long, right? unless they're doing an insert, and then uh, the constraints of the database might kick out names that are too long. Okay? There's uh, lots of interesting things uh, in optimizing the storage. Um, in 440, we talk about normalization, denormalization of data, um, which is how to store, how to represent relationships between data efficiently in storage. Uh, you can talk about persistent storage. You can talk about speeding up queries through buffering or caching of uh, recently used data. And we also talk about query optimization plans where you can answer the same questions about the data using query operations in different order to make them more or less efficient. I think this stuff is very interesting. It has uh, some bearing on how well your programs run because ultimately you do need to fetch the data and you do want to do it efficiently. Um, but, you know, we talk about it in 440. You don't need to worry about it too much right now. Um, nice thing about databases too is that once you have underlying data, you can create new tables based on the data. These are often called views, which look like another table. And in fact, you can use them like another table, but the data in them is based on other tables. So for example, we can create a view called transcript where we pull data from a bunch of other tables to create a transcript for a student with the courses they took, the greater guts, they got when they took that course and what section they were in, right? If you look back to the slides, all this data is across different tables, but you can create a query whose result is this table, and then you can use this table in other queries, right? This is kind of like a virtual table that's based on up-to-date data on the tables. All right. So with that, let's talk just a little bit more about uh, how 
data is organized in a database uh, system. Okay, so our goals here is to have a self-describing data structure, um, meaning that when you look at data, you can sort of figure out what's in it and, and what the relationships are. And, you know, sometimes it's pretty, pretty obvious. Sometimes you need to look in a little bit more into the data definition to, to read off those relationships. You want program data independence, meaning that programs should not really deal with files in which data is stored. You want to provide multiple views, uh, just like the transcript view we talked about, and ultimately maybe even multi-user transaction processing, um, though that sort of depends on how advanced the database system is. Okay, so we have this kind of prototypical um, architecture where we have three different schemas. We have the external level, we have the conceptual level, and we have the internal level. Okay, so external view, conceptual schema, and internal schema. Let's talk about them in order, okay? So the um, external view is going to be the view that users see, right? And this could be something like a mobile application through which you can uh, enter data into the database, for example, through a form or query data and get some table out. You have the conceptual schema, which is probably what most of you guys think is a database. It's basically the structure of data in some tables. And then we have the internal schema where the data behind those tables and somehow stored in files as data records in specific bytes of files. Okay. Um, oh, I guess I can answer this question. Where is the data stored? Well, ultimately everything is stored on this in files and conceptual and external views are just interpretations of the uh, file stored data. Okay, so the external view will only permit users certain operations. And the idea there is to provide users with the information they need while preventing them from screwing up the data. So maybe they can submit forms and then you can have uh, constraints on those forms, for example, forcing them to fill out certain fields. Um, you can also provide them with high-level queries to the data, for example, things like compute GPA for a given student, uh, right? Maybe they don't get to see anything else about that student, like the financial info, but a user has permissions to view the student's GPA. Um, there's different languages to define these high-level views. They're called view definition languages. In practice, most of the stuff that's used is SQL, though there are some non-SQL uh, query languages for NoSQL databases that are also popular. Um, so what type of interfaces can we build for external users? Well, tons of stuff. Tons of stuff that you really are familiar with from uh, Google Maps to Siri to all kinds of forms to access your banks, right? These are all external views of some database um, underneath. Okay. So then we have the conceptual schema, which are the tables that store the underlying data and uh, users perform queries on uh, the structure of data in those tables. Okay. So we can have entities, those could be the tables or uh, relations, that represent some real world objects in our mini world. Right? So maybe at the university we have entities such as students, entities such as courses, and some relationship between them such as students take courses. Okay? Um, those different entities will have certain attributes or data elements. Okay? So a student, for example, would have a name, student number, class, and majors. Those are all just attributes of a student. And then you can have relationships between those entities based on attributes, such as a student is enrolled in some course, okay? Um, and so here we have a uh, student, here we have a course, those are the different entities, and then uh, I don't think we have a good relationship here. Let's see, I think we have an example above. Probably reorganize this a little bit. Okay, so like a grade report, right, represents a relationship between a student and some section, 
Cool. Um, there's different languages to do data manipulation and tables. Again, mostly SQL will be used, um, but there are some other languages as well. But SQL is so widely used, basically, that's what we teach right now. Um, and then finally, you have a physical representation of the data where, as I described before, a record from a student table might be stored as a set of bytes on disk. Okay. Um, so your internal schema would define the record format as far as how many bytes are where, um, how to access the, this data. Maybe there will be some um, indexing or hashing to speed up access to certain elements. Um, for example, we can make it much, we can make it very easy to find a particular student on file versus searching by major might be a little bit harder where we first need to find the students and then find all the students in that particular major. Okay, so finally, um, kind of the do's and don'ts of databases. Um, so databases do introduce more overhead than storing data on files directly, right? You have extra hardware to run the database, extra training for users, extra interface to deal with, um, Right, there, there is some overhead with that. But it, it provides you with things like security, concurrency control against multiple users screwing up the data, uh, recovery of lost data, forcing integrity on the data through constraints, right? So it may be that you don't need all that overhead if you're just trying to store data for a single user in a single program. Um, but if you're building something bigger, you know, storing data in files and eventually building your own uh, data management system is the kind of overhead that most projects don't need. Okay. Um, but databases might not always be the right option, right? So if your data is fairly static, um, maybe just reading it from files, okay. The data never changes. Maybe just loading in a file that's been serialized is just fine. Um, if your application is particularly real time, maybe you need something more custom than a generic database. Right, that's, that's possible and certainly true in many, many applications. Okay. Same thing if you run on a really constrained system. You may not have the resources to run a database on some sensor. Right. Maybe you store sensor data in a file and then you upload that file and then convert and then insert data from that file into a database. Right. If you have only one user accessing the data, um, do you need all the stuff for concurrency control? Maybe you don't. Um, and then there's some data that doesn't need to be persistent. Um, it's just relevant for a little bit, right? So it may make sense for you to store some data in a variable or in an array or in some other data structure inside your program rather than every single change to a variable that's made in your program being written to a database. Um, so often you kind of need to ask yourself, um, who is the audience for the data and is it better served by a database or is it better served just by storing data, maybe even just in memory? All right, so that's an overview of databases. Um, on Friday, we'll talk a little bit about SQL and accessing data. And um, uh, one of the things I want to add to program assignment three, not this year, don't worry, is to actually store some of the user tables, specifically the action board in a database. And I think they would kind of nicely run out the course. I think that would have worked a little bit better if we had more face-to-face -face time, but eventually I'll get this incorporated. So anyway, Friday we'll talk about SQL. Um, all right, thank you guys.